You mentioned reinforcement learning, so you've had uh, a couple of years in the field. No, uh, <laughs> quite you know, a uh, <laughs> quite a few, uh, quite a long career in artificial intelligence broadly, but reinforcement learning specifically. Uh, can you maybe give a hint about your sense of the history of the field? And in, in some ways it's changed with the advent of deep learning, but has a long roots. Like how is it weaved in and out of your own life? How have you seen the community change or maybe the ideas that it's playing with change? I've had the privilege, the pleasure of being, of, of having almost a front row seat to a lot of this stuff. And it's been really, really fun and interesting. So uh, when I was in college in the 80s, early 80s, uh, the neural net thing was starting to happen. And uh, I was taking a lot of psychology classes and a lot of computer science classes as a college student. And I thought, you know, something that can play tic-tac-toe and just like learn to get better at it, that ought to be a really easy thing. So I spent almost almost all of my, what would have been vacations during college, like hacking on my home computer, trying to teach it how to play tic-tac-toe. and Programming language. You're basic. Right? Oh yeah, basic. that's that's I was I, that's my first language. That's my native language. Is that when you first fell in love with computer science? Just like programming basic on that? Uh, what was what was the computer? Do you remember? I had I had a TRS eighty Model One before they were called Model Ones because there was nothing else. Uh, I got my computer in nineteen seventy nine. Uh, instead, so I was I was I would have been bar mitzvahed. But instead mm -hmm. of having a big party that my parents threw on my behalf, they just got me a computer because that's what I really, really, really wanted. I saw them in the in the in the mall in Radio Shack, and I thought, "What? How are they doing that?" I would yeah. try to stump them. I would give them math problems like one plus, and then in parentheses two plus one, yeah. and I would always get it right. I'm like, "How do you know so much?" Magic. Like I've had to go to algebra class for the last few years to learn this stuff, and you just seem to know. So I was I was yeah, I was smitten and uh, got a computer and I think ages thirteen to fifteen. I have no memory of those years. I think I just was in my room with the computer, listening to Billy Joel, communing, possibly listening to the radio, listening to Billy Joel. That was the one album I had uh, on vinyl at that time, and um, and then I got it on cassette tape and that was really helpful because <laughs> then I could play it. I didn't have to go down to my parents' Wi-Fi or Hi-Fi. Sorry. Uh, and at age 15, I remember kind of walking out and like, okay, I'm ready to talk to people again. Like I've learned what I need to learn here. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, so, so that, was, that was my home computer. And so I went to college and I was like, oh, I'm totally gonna study computer science. And I, I opted, the college I chose specifically had a computer science major. The one that I really wanted, the college I really wanted to go to didn't. So bye-bye to which, them. Which college did you go to? So I went to Yale. Uh, Princeton would have been way more convenient and it was just a beautiful campus and it was close enough to home. And I was really excited about Princeton and I visited. I said, so computer science major, like, well, we have computer engineering. I'm like, oh, I don't like that word engineering. <laughs> 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 I, I like computer science. I really, I want to do, like you're saying hardware and software. They're like, yeah. I'm like, I just want to do software. I, I couldn't care less about hardware. And you grew up in Philadelphia? I grew up outside Philly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, so the you know local schools were like Penn and Drexel and... Uh, Temple, like everyone in my family went to Temple at least at one point in their lives, except for me. So yeah, it was a Philly, Philly family. Yale had a computer science department and that's when you, it, it's kind of interesting you said 80s and neural networks. That's when you, neural networks was a hot new thing or a hot thing period. Uh, so what is that in college when you first learned about neural networks? Yeah, or yeah. when she learned, like how And did it was you... in a psychology class, not in a oh, CS wow. class. Yeah. Was it psychology or cognitive science or like, do you remember like what context? It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I was a, I've always been a bit of a cognitive psychology groupie. Mm -hmm. So like I'm a, I study computer <laughs> science, but I like, I like to hang around where the cognitive si scientists yeah. are. Cause I don't know, brains, man, they're like, they're wacky. Cool. <laughs> and they have a bigger picture view of things. They're a little less engineery. I would say they're more, they're more that's, interested that's in the nature of cognition and intelligence and perception and how like the vision system work. Like they're asking always bigger questions. Now with the, the deep learning community, there I think more there's a lot of intersections. But I do find in, that the the neuroscience folks actually and uh, uh, co cognitive psychology, cognitive science folks are starting to learn how to program, how to use neural artificial neural networks. And they are actually approaching problems in like totally new, mm -hmm. interesting ways. Yeah. It's fun to watch that grad students from those departments 
like approach to problem of machine learning. And, right, they come in with a different perspective. Yeah, yeah, they don't care about like your ImageNet data set or whatever. <laughs> they, they want like to understand the, the, the like the basic mechanisms at the at the neuronal level, at mm -hmm. the functional level of intelligence, so it's it's kind of it's kind of co co cool to see them work. But yeah, okay. So you you always love you were always a groupie of cognitive psychology. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, so it was in a class by Richard Gehrig. He was kind of my my favorite uh, psych professor in college, and I took uh, like three different classes with him. And yeah, so they, they, we were, they were talking specifically the class. I think was kind of a. There was a big paper that was written by Steven Pinker and uh, Prince. I don't, I'm blanking on Prince's first name, but Prince and Pinker and Prince, they wrote kind of a, uh, they were at that time kind of like, oh, I'm blanking on the names of the current people. Um, the uh, cognitive scientists who are complaining a lot about deep networks. Oh, uh, Gary. Uh, Gary Marcus. Gary Marcus. Yeah. And who else? I mean, there, there, there's a few, but Gary, yeah. Gary is the most feisty. Sure, Gary's very feisty, and with his with his co author, they they you know they're kind of doing these kind of takedowns where they say, okay, well, yeah, it does all these amazing amazing things, but here's a shortcoming, here's a shortcoming, here's a shortcoming, and so the Pinker Prince paper is kind of like the that generation's version of Marcus and Davis, right, where they're they're trained as cognitive scientists, but they're looking skeptically at the results in the in the artificial intelligence neural net kind of world and saying, yeah, it can do this and this and this, but like it can't do that and it can't do that and it can't do that. Maybe in principle or maybe just in practice at this point. But but the fact of the matter is you're you've narrowed your focus too far to be impressed. You know, you're impressed with the the things within that circle, but you need to broaden that circle a little bit. You need to look at a, a wider set of problems. And so um so we so I was in this seminar in college that was basically a, a close reading of the Pinker Prince paper, which was like really thick. There was a lot going on in there. And um and it and, and it talked about the reinforcement learning idea a little bit. I'm like, oh, that sounds really cool because behavior is what is really interesting to me about mm. psychology anyway. So making programs that, I mean, programs are things that behave. People are things that behave. Like I wanna make learning that learns to behave. In which way was reinforcement learning presented? Is this uh, talking about human and animal behavior or are we talking about actual mathematical constructs? Ah, that's a, right, so that's a good question, right. So this is, I think it wasn't actually talked about as behavior in the paper that I was reading. I think that it just talked about learning and to me, learning is about learning to behave, but really right. neural nets at that point were about learning, to, like supervised learning. So learning to produce outputs from inputs. So I kind of tried to invent reinforcement learning. Yes. I, uh, when I graduated, I joined a research group at Bellcore, which had spun out of Bell Labs recently at that time because of the divestiture of the of long distance and local phone service in the 1980s, 1984. Uh, and I was in a group uh, with Dave Ackley, who, was the first author of the Boltzmann machine paper. So the very mm -hmm. first neural net paper that could handle XOR, right? So XOR sort of killed neural nets. The, the very first, the zero with order first winter. Nets. Yeah, um, the, the Perceptron's paper. And Hinton, along with his student, Dave Ackley, and, and I think there was other authors as well, showed that, no, 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 with Boltzmann machines, we can actually learn nonlinear concepts. And so everything's back on the table again. And that yeah. kind of started that second wave of neural networks. So Dave Ackley w was, he became my mentor at, at Belcor. And we talked a lot about learning and life and computation and how all these things fit together. Now Dave and I have a podcast together. So um, so I get to kind of <laughs> enjoy that sort of his his perspective uh, once again, even, even all these years later. And so I said, so I said, I was really interested in learning, but f in the concept of behavior. And he's like, oh, well, that's reinforcement learning here. And he gave me uh, Rich Sutton's 1984 TD paper. So I read that paper. I honestly didn't get all of it, but I got the idea. I got that they were using, that he was using ideas that I was familiar with in the context of neural nets and, and like sort of backprop. Uh, but with this idea of making predictions over time. I'm like, this is so interesting, but I don't really get all the details I said to Dave. And Dave said, oh, well, why don't we have him come and give a talk? Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait, what, you can do that? Like, these are real people? I thought they were just words. I thought it was just like ideas that somehow magically seeped into paper. Yeah. He's like, no, I, I, I know Rich. Like, we'll just have him come down and, and he'll give a talk. 
and so I was, you know, my mind was blown. And uh, so Rich came and he gave a talk at Belcor um, and he talked about what he was super excited, which was they had just figured out at the time uh, Q learning. So uh, Watkins had visited the Rich Sutton's lab at, at UMass or it's Andy Bartow's lab that Rich was a part of. And um, he was really excited about this because it resolved a whole bunch of problems that he didn't know how to resolve in the in the earlier paper. And so- uh, and For people who don't know, TD, temporal difference, it's, these are all just algorithms for reinforcement learning. Right, and, and TD, temporal difference in, in particular, is about making predictions over time. And you can try to use it for making decisions, right? Because if you can predict how good a future action, or an action outcomes will be in the future, you can choose one that has better and, or, but the theory didn't really support changing your behavior. Like the predictions had to be of a consistent process if you really wanted it to work. And one of the things that was really cool about Q learning, another algorithm for reinforcement learning, is it was off policy, which meant that you could actually be learning about the environment and what the value of different actions would be while actually figuring out how to behave optimally. Yeah. And so that was a revelation. Yeah, and the proof of that is kind of interesting. I mean, that's really surprising to me when I first read that in, an, in Rich, Rich Sutton's book on the matter. It's it's kind of beautiful that a single equation can capture one all- One equation, one, one line of code, and like you can learn anything. Yeah, like- uh, enough time. <laughs> so equation and code, you're right. Like you can, the code that you can arguably, at least if you like squint your eyes, can say this is all of intelligence. <laughs> is it that you can implement that in a single? Well, I think I started with Lisp, which is uh, mm. sh shout out to Lisp, uh, like a single line of code, a key piece of code, maybe a couple that you could do that. It's kind of magical. It, it's uh, feels too good to be true. Well, and it sort of is. Yeah, it's kind of. <laughs> it seems they require of. an awful lot of extra stuff supporting it, but yeah. but nonetheless, the idea is the the idea is really good. And as far as we know, it is it is a very reasonable way of trying to create adaptive behavior, behavior that gets better at something over time. Did you find the idea of optimal uh, at all compelling? That you could prove that it's optimal. So, like one part of computer science that it makes people feel warm and fuzzy inside is when you can prove something like that a sorting algorithm, worst case, runs in n log n and it makes everybody feel so good. Even though in reality, it doesn't really matter what the worst case is. What matters is like, does this thing actually work in practice on this particular actual set of data that I that I enjoy? Did you? So here's, that, here's a place where I have maybe a strong opinion. Uh-oh. Which is like, you're right, of course, but no, no. Like, so, so the, what makes worst case so great, right? If, if you have a worst case analysis so great is that you get modularity. You can take that thing and plug it into another thing and still have some understanding of what's gonna happen when you click them together, right? If it just works well in practice, in other words, with respect to some distribution that you care about, when you go plug it into another thing, that distribution can shift, it can change, and your thing may not work well anymore. And you want it to, and you wish it does, and you hope that it will, but it might not, and then ah. So you're so so you're saying you don't like uh, machine learning. <laughs> <laughs> but we have some positive Guaranteed. theoretical results for these things. I, you know, you can come back at me with, yeah, but they're really weak, and yeah, they're really weak, and and you can even say that you know sorting algorithms, like if you do the optimal sorting algorithm, it's not really the one that you want, and that might be true as well, but. But it is, the modularity is a really powerful statement. I that really like that. As an engineer, that. you can then assemble different things. You can count on them to be, I mean, it's interesting. It's it's a balance, like with everything else in life, you don't want to get too obsessed. I mean, this is what computer scientists do, which they tend to like get obsessed and they over-optimize things that, or they start by optimizing and then they over-optimize. Yeah. So it's, it's easy to like get really granular about this thing, mm. but like the step from an n squared to an n log n sorting algorithm is a big leap mm. for most real world systems. No matter what the actual behavior of the system is, that's a big leap. And the same can probably be uh, said for other kind of first uh, leaps that you would take on a particular problem. Like it's the picking the low hanging fruit mm -hmm. or whatever the equivalent of 
doing the not the dumbest thing, but the next to the dumbest thing. It's I see, picking it's, the most delicious reachable fruit. Yeah, most delicious reachable fruit. I don't know why that's not a saying. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, <laughs> so you then this is the '80s, and this kind of idea starts to percolate of, uh, of yeah. Learning I mean, at that assistance. point, I got to meet, meet, meet I got to meet Rich Sutton, so everything was sort of downhill from there, I and mean, that was that was really the <laughs> pinnacle of everything. Um, but then I, you know, then I felt like I was kind of on the inside. So then, as interesting results were happening, I could like check in with with Rich or with Jerry Tassaro, who had a huge impact on uh, kind of early thinking in in temporal difference learning and reinforcement learning and, and showed that you could do, you could solve problems that we didn't know how to solve any other way. Um, and so that was really cool. So it was good things were happening. I would hear about it from either the people who were doing it or the people who were talking to the people who were doing it. And so I was able to track things pretty well through, through the nineties. <laughs> so what, uh, wasn't most of the excitement on reinforcement learning in the nineties era with, what is it, TD Gamma? Like, yeah, what's the role of these kind of little, like, fun game playing things and breakthroughs about, uh, get, you know, exciting the community? Was that, like, what, what were your, because uh, you've also built a cross, or <laughs> were part of building a cross or a puzzle uh, solver, oh, program, yeah. solving program uh, called Pro Proverb. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you were interested in this as a, as a problem like in forming, in using games to understand how to build uh, intelligent systems. So like, what did you think about TD Gamma? Like, what did you think about that whole thing in the 90s? Yeah, I mean, I found the TD Gamma result really just remarkable. So I had known about some of Jerry's stuff before he did TD Gamma, and he did a, a system just more vanilla, well, not, in, not entirely vanilla, but a more classical backproppy kind of uh, network for playing backgammon where he was training it on expert moves. So it was kind of supervised, mm -hmm. but the way that it worked was not to mimic the actions, but to learn internally an evaluation function. So to learn, well, if the expert chose this over this, that must mean that the expert values this more than this. And so let me adjust my weights to make it so that the network evaluates this as being better than this. So it could learn from from human preferences, it could learn its own preferences. Yeah. And then when he took the step from that to actually doing it as a, a full-on reinforcement learning problem where you didn't need a trainer, you could just let it play, that was that was remarkable, right? And so I think as, as humans often do, as we've done in the recent past as well, people extrapolate. It's like, oh, well, if you can do that, which is obviously very hard, then obviously you could do all these other problems that we that we want to solve that we know are also really hard, and it turned out very few of them ended up being practical. Um, partly because I think neural nets, certainly at the time, were struggling to be consistent and reliable, and so training them in a reinforcement learning setting was a bit of a mess. I had uh, I don't know generation after generation of like master students who wanted to do value function approximation, basically learn reinforcement learning with neural nets. And over and oh, over and over again, we were failing. We couldn't get the, the good results that Jerry Tassaro got. I now believe that Jerry is a neural net whisperer. He has a particular ability to get neural networks to do things that other people would find impossible. And it's not the technology, it's the technology and Jerry together. Yeah, at which... I think speaks to the role of the human expert in the process of machine learning. Right, it's so easy. We we're, we're so drawn to the idea that that it's the technology that is that is is where the power is coming from. That I think we lose sight of the, of the fact that sometimes you need a really good. And just like I mean, no one would think, hey, here's this great piece of software. Here's like I don't know, GNU Emacs or whatever. Um, <laughs> and doesn't that prove that computers are super powerful and yeah. basically going to take over the world? It's like. No, Stallman is a hell of a hacker, right? Yeah. So he was able to make the code do these amazing things. He couldn't have done it without the computer, but the computer couldn't have done it without him. And so I think people discount the role of people like Jerry who who um, who have a, just a particular, a particular set of skills. 